uh, at the uh, Hilton London Olympia Hotel, and it was a really terrific discussion among uh, both content delivery providers and content owners uh, and associated uh, uh, people. And uh, I think everyone was really thrilled with the, uh, the fact that the event turned into more of a conversation than it was a one-to-many presentation. And that's certainly something that we encourage in all our sessions. Um, there will be time for Q&A, of course, at the end of each session, but uh, you know, don't feel like you have to wait until the last 10 minutes to ask questions, because if these sessions can turn into a dialogue, uh, that's always more productive than, than simply, uh, as I said, a, a sort of one-to-many uh, presentation. So I encourage you to ask questions. We'll certainly have time for Q&A at the end of today's keynote. Uh, we also have uh, the Connected Home Summit going on uh, across the hall in the, uh, the room next to Track B, uh, which is uh, moderated by and programmed by uh, William Cooper from Informative. And uh, we've got a great group of people there to talk at a very high level about issues surrounding the connected home. So today's keynote couldn't be more timely. Uh, so if you're interested in that uh, in particular, feel free to pop in there uh, from 10.30 until 12.30. Uh, lunch will be uh, also from 12.30 until 1.45 in the uh, exhibition hall. Make sure you stop in there and see our exhibitors. I want to thank all of our sponsors for uh, helping make Streaming Media Europe happen this year. Uh, in addition to our sponsors, we have delegates from 28 countries, which uh, is actually pretty impressive when you think about it. And we're very well represented, especially by the Scandinavian countries. So I want to spend, send a special shout out to them, and not just because my surname is Rasmussen. Um, but uh, let's get started uh, with uh, today's keynote. Uh, Ian Mecklenburg from Virgin Media is going to talk about Virgin's Connected Home Strategy, which will give us a great kickoff for uh, both the Connected Home Summit and uh, Streaming Media Europe in general. So welcome, Ian. Hi there. I'm Ian Mecklenburg, uh, Director of Consumer Platforms for Virgin Media. And that's a scary looking man pointing something at you. So sorry that's been sitting there so long, I just realized. Um, one, one of the things I think it's really important for us to cover is how many people here are UK centric and how many people are from overseas? How many are UK? That's probably about half and half. Um, so I think what, one of the key things is just to explain who or in some ways what Virgin Media actually is. Um, we're, a lot of people think about us as a cable company, but actually we're one of the biggest ISPs. Um, and we've got something like four, four and a half million broadband customers. Um, we run, sorry, this microphone, I'm going to turn around, apologies for that. Um, we actually run uh, fibre pretty much to the cabinet and then there's hybrid fibre coax network and we're able to offer high speed broadband and it's real high speed broadband. So at the moment our standard consumer offerings go up to 100 meg. Um, we've actually successfully trialled one and a half gig to customer premises um, but one of the things we always say is that you can't really watch television any faster. So one of the things we're looking at is in a connected home, what, what are you actually going to do with the bandwidth? Um, we have, we're actually a quad play provider, so we have over 3 million um, contract mobile customers, um, and that's part of where the Virgin brand came from. So we looked at the excitement of the Virgin brand and sort of said, well, this is what's happening in mobile. How do we bring that into this converged services kind of organization? Um, <coughs> excuse me, too much coffee this morning. Um, but actually one of the interesting things we've done is, as a cable TV operator, again, it's kind of a cliche, but cable television has always been connected television. You know, the, the boxes we have that are 10 years old are actually connected boxes. Um, and that's where we've been driving a lot of video on demand and other kind of services that people think about as being part of this new wave. Is, is actually something that traditional, as we call it, video on demand or cloud-based video serving, um, is actually meaning we're, we're going to get close to, in fact, we're going to go over 1 billion views this year of video on demand which is, in a country the size of the UK, is actually pretty significant. So that's something that we've been learning and we're picking up on. Um, the iPlayer, obviously very popular, renowned globally, we actually deliver between 20 and 25% of total iPlayer views. <coughs> so that's actually on television sets now, big screen televisions, not PCs. That's actually delivering real video on demand services to customers. And that's 25% of that total viewing. Um, so we're actually sort of setting ourselves up for a converged space where we actually understand the entertainment services, 
we're also able to deliver lots of bits very quickly into the homes. Um, and we've, we, you know, we've tried to work out, well, how do we address that? We could actually be just a simple high-speed pipe, or we can actually add value for the customer. And one of the things that we, we looked at early on was in, in this OTT world, um, we can deliver a fantastic pipe with lots of bits, but actually for the average customer who's an entertainment customer, that really is quite a hard proposition. You know, the cliche, if anyone's running the timer, my mum, 82 years old, now has video on demand, interactive TV services, <coughs> a very complex platform, but she knows nothing about a DNS. She knows nothing about how to configure her television. And that was part of the challenge we sort of set ourselves, was to say, actually, although we can do these things, should we? Should we actually make life complicated? Or should we actually help the customer along the journey? So the, f the first thing in a connected streaming entertainment world is, which device should I use? If I can get the iPlayer, for example, on five different devices all connected to my television, which, which one of the devices should I use? How am I going to get that as the best service? Um, which input do I need on the television? There's a connected television hub. There's a PlayStation input. There's an Apple TV input. Actually, which one of those do I use? How, how do I select that? Which remote control do I actually pick up? So, you know, the, this is just a selection of some of the remote controls that let you access digital media services in your home. There isn't any consistency. So one of the things for the customer is, where's the pause button? This is something that we wrestled with, with various things. Is actually, if you're watching television, on a television, you're used to basic transport controls. Most of the over-the-top internet video type services really don't have the concept of a pause button other than a mouse hovering over something on the screen. You don't actually have that in a, in a, <coughs> excuse me, in a, in a TV UI. So you know, some of the basic interaction metaphors really start to change when you're looking at these services. It's great saying you can take something that's on a PC screen and move it to a bigger screen, but actually that's not what television or entertainment's really about. Um, you know, we can see the, the classic QWERTY keyboards for television. Again, that's something that's very intimidating for people. And things like search and discovery shouldn't necessarily be text-based. We think it's a case of a journey for recommendation search, <coughs> excuse me, um, based on what people actually do day to day. So one of the things that we've discovered, and I'll go into this more, is actually in a world of unlimited content, how do people actually find things? You, know, they, you don't necessarily want to go and type a search string using a QWERTY keyboard. You may be looking for something, or you may want something suggested to you. So when you're at home on the sofa, you've had a long day at work, the last thing you need is like a very intense lean back, lean forward. Which am I going to do? Am I going to search something? Am I going to have something presented to me? So you've got to find an easy way of recommending content to people, surfacing content for people. Great, thank you. <coughs> Yeah, how do we actually get material presented to the customer that's actually something that's going to present them sometimes with a surprise? Because in a search world, you always know exactly what you're looking for. But actually, with entertainment, a broadcaster, a channel operator will present material to you that you weren't expecting. It's something new. It's a surprise. And in, and in a computer-centric world, that doesn't really exist. So following that, you know, I can do those things. How do I configure this television experience? Well, normally you just plug a television on and it works. So that's a part of the challenge we had. Um, a huge thing we've had um, as a platform operator is respecting things like security for watershed adult content. All those things that, again, in a straight over-the-top world, there isn't necessarily any regulation around. There's no, there's no control. There's no understanding of protection of children, watershed moments, content ratings. It's just all there as search, and you may or may not get to the content you're looking for. But when the kids have got a TV remote control, there's a lot of content on the internet you don't want them to see. So as a platform, that's part of what we had to respect. Um, one of the big things is, you know, people, it's all, you know, the growth has all been around high quality, high definition content. Actually, in a straight streaming world, can I do something as simple as watch one program and record another if they're both HD? That's something on a standard DSL connection you really can't do. So that, that was another one of the big challenges that we set ourselves. <coughs> and probably one of the most important ones, finally, was 
actually, with all of the very, ooh, various players that are out there, how do we actually make sure that customers don't end up in lots of little islands? In a web environment, you can go to one web page, it looks one way, it takes the brand, obviously the brand's really important. There are whole brand departments actually saying, this is how our content needs to look, this is the way we'll present things to people. Then you move to the next one. Now, good old my mother doesn't need to know that she has a different navigation metaphor because it conforms to some of the brand guidelines when she wants to watch Downton Abbey instead of Upstairs Downstairs. Two pieces of content, she shouldn't have a different navigation experience for each one. She shouldn't be stranded somewhere in the way she would on a computer when she's watching television. So all, all of these things kind of came together and we were like, well, you know, th this, this is not television. This is just really hard. This is really clever stuff. We've got a big pipe, you know, 100 meg, please take it. All of the things that you can offer to someone, but actually it's not television. Television is about entertainment, relaxation, enjoyment. Digital video might be about something different. So the challenge we set ourselves was, how do we make this simpler? And we, I think I'm to blame for the through the middle bit, but if it's not over the top, what is it? It's kind of a through the middle concept. So what we said was, we've actually got a big cable network. Um, you know, if you look, we can run internet traffic, broadband traffic, <coughs> video on demand, all in parallel. But the customer shouldn't really know or care how that's, how that's actually being delivered. So you know, we kind of called it through the middle. We've got a huge pipe. You know, it sounds like we're showing off, but you know, big, large capacity fiber running around the country, we're gonna, we might as well use that. So part of that is saying, here's a broadband service over here, but that's not what we're talking about. This is television. This is actually entertainment. So how do we bring all these things together? Well, we create a very simple interface for people. We actually say, yes, there's lots of clever things you could do, but actually interactive, streaming, TV, just come together in one place. Um, and the other thing was the cable company of old would have decided to engineer everything itself, made everything proprietary, locked, locked the environment down, taken five years to actually innovate to change anything. You know, we know that from experience. So actually what we did was say, let's build on top of standards. There's some control in this, but it's a standard-based platform. So, da -da, we created our TiVo service. Um, now, what we've done is we've not, as a lot of people think, resold American retail TiVo boxes. <coughs> oh, sorry, we're about that. We've actually said we've created a new hardware platform, and we've worked with our friends at TiVo to actually create this new middleware environment. What we've done is we've based that on what's happening in the in the U.S., but actually. We've got a lot to learn, in, you know, a lot from Europe that we've done that's ahead of what the US guys have done. So we've worked together to say things like catch-up television isn't really a big deal in the US on TV. Obviously, we have the iPlayer here. Uh, our video on demand library is 1 billion VOD views. That's something that we've integrated into this core platform. So we've actually said, how do we push the, push the envelope? How do we move things forward? So we work closely as a middleware layer, but at a service layer to say, let's create a new product. So I'm going to try and show a video, but if given it was streaming media, I was going to try and get it from YouTube. So if it doesn't work, you can just imagine there was a video here. Uh, it worked earlier, whether it will now. You know, it's great having hundreds of channels. But scrolling through them all to find what you want is, well, you know. On the other hand, with Virgin Media's TiVo box, you can search for your favourite show, actor or director and find loads of stuff they've done in seconds. Easy. We think it's the best way to watch TV ever. But what do you think? See you online. It did work amazing, streaming media. Um, so, basically, that was, one, that was part of the proposition that we set ourselves, was to say, how do we get past all of that confusion? And that was just a quick shot of how we're actually presenting that to the customer. But just in case there are a few geeks in the audience, I am actually one of them. There's lots of technology in that box with all of these things. But actually, the key thing we wanted to get across to people was, actually, it's a really good way of watching TV. So I had real arguments with our marketing, our brand people, who wanted to say, let's push the speed of the modem. Let's tell people how, you know, how much memory is in it, what the processor is. And actually, that's actually irrelevant for the customers. Actually, people want, want the best way to watch TV ever. It's a case of making television better and easier for them. 
rather than throwing lots of technology, <coughs> lots of technology at them. So we've hidden, we've hidden a lot of that in, in the way we've delivered the services, which is really important. This is not about technology. We don't want the technology sold. With, you know, obviously things like the terabyte hard drive, you know, built-in DOCSIS modem that doesn't take any broadband. They're product features. They're not necessarily saying it's a horsepower war or a memory spec war. It's actually what we do with it. It's like the pipe. It's a big pipe. It's what we do with it that's important. So some of the things we actually launched with, and apologies, some people have probably seen these sort of things a few times, but we tried to wrap together most of what the trends in the industry, you know, things that people would expect in a next generation platform. So the first thing we did was make sure that we had a backwards and forwards EPG. So our EPG goes forward 14 days to let you plan recordings and set things up. You can actually go back seven days and, as our marketing people call it, unmiss programs. So if you get into work tomorrow, someone says, oh, did you see that program that was on at 7 o'clock yesterday? You didn't set a recording. You missed the fact it was on. You just can go to the grid, go backwards in time to 7 o'clock yesterday, press play, and that will come from our video server or cloud-based streaming platform. Very simple stuff, actually incredibly powerful for the customer, which is not learning a new interface. It's not finding a new way of navigating. They've just be, they're just able to go backwards in time the same way they've always been able to go forwards in time to actually look at an EPG. <clears throat> One of the things that actually is incredibly powerful in, in the TiVo platform is 10 years of intelligence. Now, the TiVo thumbs, people know, basically, we don't use many red ones in these, which we should, but there's a scale of three thumbs down to three thumbs up for content that you like. It's very easy on a simple TV remote control program comes up and you say, I like that. Every time you record something, it gives you one thumb. You assume, the box assumes if you recorded it, then you quite like something. If you really like something, you give it two. And if you really, really like it, you give it three. Now that's something that gradually builds up over time. The box begins to understand the kind of programming you like. You know, there was a campaign in the US a few years ago was, my TiVo thinks I'm gay, because people were recording lots of content, the Sex and the City, various other things, and suddenly the TiVo took on a personality. In the early days, we had some very interesting experiences with a limited sample of people where we were just testing things out about the type of content that gets promoted. But actually, there, there are multiple layers of the recommendation and personalization facility. So the box itself knows what you're doing, but actually we use collaborative filtering to say, this is what the community of people are doing. So the more people that actually come onto the platform, the more the recommendation engine improves. If you like this, you'll like this. That's all happening in the background. So we could have put in the features list, crowd-based, crowd-source collaborative filtering engine to do cloud-based delivery of recommendation. Actually, no, we just use TiVo thumbs. <coughs> so there's a lot of technology hidden from the user that's actually part of the good buzzword bingo that we could actually play. But that, that's something that's been in there. So people are actually now, you get home, you press something called My Shows, and there's a load of content sitting there on, on the terabyte drive that you haven't actually explicitly said, I want that recorded, but the box says, you like that, I think you'll like this, I'm going to record these for you. And actually, people are finding, once they press the button, they're, quite, they're pleasantly surprised, and, and those recommendations are gaining more and more power as, as the community of boxes we have, and we'll announce numbers next week, but um, it, it's quite a successful product. Um, so those numbers are actually building very quickly, and those recommendations are improving because the more people in the sample, the, be the better the recommendations. Um, but as well as doing that automatically, when you're looking for content, we can surface things. So if you look on those screens, the bar at the top is something called the discovery bar. That is a mixture of something we editorialize and something the boxes promote themselves. So as you go through, each one of those content icons will say, this is recommended because it's similar to something else you enjoyed. <clears throat> Alternatively, because, you know, do the Eric Schmidt thing, because we've all done like, my box would only have bad sci-fi in there, which is pretty much true. So part of what we do is throw editorial suggestions from um, our team of editors on highlights, picks of the week. So things that actually we need to surface to people so they learn new things, so they discover new content that's actually, <clears throat> actually out on our platform. So, you know, that, that's really important to say to people, it's great the computer tells you everything you like, but how will you ever discover anything new? I admit, amongst my sci-fi, 
I actually watched Downton Abbey. Never thought I was a bonnet drama fan. Actually, I quite like something like that. And that's the kind of thing that gets surfaced because other people like these kind of programmes. <clears throat> but as well as all that, we thought, yep, well, this uh, IP-based internet video thing is quite popular. How do we throw that in there? Because, again, I think a traditional cable company would have said, well, that's not on our platform, that's not our content, that's not our network. How, what, why would we do that to people? So we said, no, nope, we'll build that into the UI. So actually, when you're searching for content, if it's not on our platform, we actually will say, you know what, that's actually available on YouTube, or something with that search string is available on YouTube. So that's something, again, saying to people, we're not locking you into a wall garden. We're saying, here's a managed environment, but actually we've got paths out to the outside world because that's important. So following on from that, what we've done is say, as well as the big brands, the big video applications, how do we take the platform forward? So we've added in what, what we call the TV-centric applications. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, making very clear to everyone that this is not a, a really bad computer, which is what happens with a lot of interactive TV platforms. You know, it can only be a bad computer. It can never be as powerful as a computer plugged into a flat panel display. But what telly is good at is being TV. So what we've created are a set of interactive TV applications that, that are good for video streaming. And I'll touch on a couple of those in a minute. Um, and the other thing that actually has been a real surprise to us and other people that we're working with is the insatiable desire for metadata that these boxes and these platforms have. Everything relates to everything else. So when you search on something, it tells you that this is Hugh Laurie in-house. It actually also says Hugh Laurie has also been in these other things. So from the customer, it's an interesting TV surfing metaphor. But we need to constantly have we've got now back catalogues of every series of house. Every, every series of everything is now on the platform. And the image data that goes with that. So you, you're able to search. We now need to say, well, if that's not on our platform, how else do you find that? So we're constantly having to build and build and build all of this metadata that actually makes the entire platform work. And it's been really interesting. <laughs> we've even, yeah, probably the problems we're having to solve that most people here haven't even realized they're going to have yet are complaints around lineup of a judging panel changing. Cheryl, we actually had a complaint that we had Cheryl Cole's old hairstyle actually on an image. So someone on a TV program changed their hairstyle. We actually had one person complain that our platform was out of date because a month later we hadn't actually updated an image of someone who was one of the presenters. These, these are the kind of things that we're having to deal with and solve already that most people aren't even aware of when they're still looking at textual metadata. So that's you know, a huge thing that actually driving the platform to make it look graphically rich and to make the search and everything work. Underneath, again, there's a massive complexity, these massive engines for metadata, discovery, descriptions around the programming. Even things like first air date. So in Europe, programs air on different dates. If you take a generic metadata package, that's no use. So we have to know when something first aired in the UK to know if it's new or a repeat. So constantly feeding this machine is really, really interesting exercise and expensive one. And I think something that most people haven't actually appreciated is going to be a problem yet for them. Um, and as well as that, we sort of threw in things like remote record and, and kind of things that we, we now consider that are hygiene factors. Um, so, you know, just a quick slide, sort of, this, this is just one of the screens, but it kind of pulls together what a lot of those, you know, that those facets of the service actually look like. So, as I said, the, the discovery bar at the top, that has personalized recommendations. So things are actually surfaced there, as I said, based on the algorithms. The rich metadata that we have on the side isn't just a description, it's who's in a program, it's what the crowdsource ratings are. It's actually, there's, <laughs> there's an awful lot that's hidden in the UI that people are beginning to understand. So if you look on the bottom right there, that tells you that that's on live TV and in high definition. It would also have another little OD icon to tell you it was available on demand. So at a glance, as you're working through the system, you can see what your options are to actually view the content. So that means I know that Toy Story is going to be on. I can just press a recording button. I don't need to know when. I just say, yeah, record Toy Story for me, and that will actually appear. <clears throat> Where you see the editorialized collections and all this stuff down the side, this is something where we have a team of people pulling together this data, pulling together these collections. So that's actually saying each week now we have a new series on the platform, 
new series coming up across all of the networks. So it's, it's a new way of actually showing the content that's coming. You know, people have hundreds of channels now. How do you find what's on? How, how's that recommended to you? So we have a team of editors pulling that together. We have Vampire's collection. We have Tiny Tot's collection. Um, and actually, some things we're beginning to realize is, um, I don't know why we always use a fairly morbid one, but when Elizabeth Taylor died, the team were really pleased that the next day they had an Elizabeth Taylor collection, which had movies, documentaries, all thrown together. It was current, and effectively it was like a mini Elizabeth Taylor channel came up. The Royal Wedding, they had documentaries about previous Royal Weddings. They had Disney movies. They had various other princess-related stuff that basically picked up the vibe of the Royal Wedding. So what it says is, un under one icon, and I can't sync my metadata in this, um, under a single icon, we're actually able to pull together movies, programming, and interactive applications. Something, again, it's all hidden. There's a lot of complexity there to the previous point, but actually to someone there's a nice, simple to use icon that pulls together different media types from across different sources that's nicely hidden to them. Uh, so actually, what's that doing? So we, we've got a, a representative sample now. The product's really been on the market for a few months. Um, and what we're, what we're finding is far, far quicker than we expected that customer behavior is actually changing quite significantly. So what's as people are using the platform, they've already gravitated away from the grid-based EPG faster than we expected. So we think that's really interesting. So we're not telling anyone to do this. There's no one going into anyone's home. We're just giving people the boxes. And the power of the UI is actually saying, oh, by the way, there's, there's a new way of doing something. Just you know, here's something that's actually there. So we're saying um, a quarter of the channel views um, by the way, because we can track everything because it's a connected platform. Before, so this is not anecdotal stuff. The, the platform is monitoring all of this activity. Um, yes, interactive advertising, we'll touch with that later if you want. Um, but we're saying already a quarter of the channel viewing is not actually coming from the EPG. It's coming from search, it's coming from the recommendations up the, the top there. We're seeing on average people are watching two to three programs a week that originate from the discovery bar rather than other forms of navigation. Um, and something that's really good for the content brands rather than necessarily the linear channels is that we've discovered um, half of the top ten searches were for programs that aren't in the Barbrator, which is the equivalent of Nielsen, most popular shows. So things like Dexter, Fringe, that are quite popular with big audiences, um, don't register in terms of the normal content popularity. So it's saying, actually, people are looking for content that isn't necessarily surfaced, isn't necessarily the most popular content, but they're going out and say, oh, where do I find this program? How do I set that recording? Um, you know, which is really interesting behavior. We didn't expect to see this soon. Um, we've got a lot more stats that we're going to start publishing on a sort of quarterly basis because it's, it really is shifting the way people use and watch television. And it is television, not streaming. Um, we're finding that, on average, people are using roughly once per working day. Um, the TV-centric apps are used four and a half times a week. And th this, is, this has moved beyond, to make it clear where we've positioned it, this is our core platform. This isn't being sold as a premium add-on, an early adopter product anymore. This is our core television platform. This is a PVR that does this other stuff. But actually, people are using it differently, and they're also using the interactive apps. So we're actually seeing an average of four and a half apps being used a week. So that's things like YouTube, iPlayer, um, we have you know, video-based celebrity information. All of those things are actually coming in there as well, um, which is a surprise how quickly that happened. And the kind of things we've done is, I, I call them mini channels. Um, so we've created for V Festival, which is a virgin um, festival that runs in the summer. We created, you could almost call it, it's a V Festival app, but it was like a mini channel that ran during V. It's still on there now. We had interviews with the bands, backstage stuff, um, there's, I couldn't get a video of this, but um, as a background, if you want, you can actually see a live Twitter feed running over it. You're not using the TV remote to put tweets in, but you can actually see live news and information running over IP video. It's very easy to put forward, it's a flash application, very easy to put together, create a new type of channel. Um, we run a short film award, so Virgin Media Shorts, so for small, independent, up-and-coming filmmakers. 
actually, how on earth would they normally get their content, their shorts, out to a big population of TV viewers? You know, it's never going to be scheduled on a channel. They can put it on YouTube, but actually to have it presented to people on television is a great opportunity. So we've created the Virgin Media Shorts app, which allows the independent filmmakers to have their content displayed and seen by our television audience. So it's another innovative use of saying, how do we push those things forward? Um, for Harry Potter, we did a Harry Potter app, funnily enough, uh, for the premiere, in conjunction with Warner Brothers. Um, so we had live video feeds from the red carpet. We had the equivalent of the DVD box sets for all of the previous movies. Is a collection, the collection I showed you previously. We had Harry Potter collection, which was the previous six movies available on demand. So basically we created a Harry Potter experience on the platform, relatively straightforward, which was the VOD library, an interactive app, a live feed from the premiere, and a constant news feed running over the top of it. Something that you couldn't normally do with a TV platform without months of effort and planning and release cycles. But we took a basic interactive TV video-centric app and created that kind of new experience for people. Um, we're actually working quite closely with various local services and communities um, to create local television. Because again, a lot of work, you know, we're working with Jeremy Hunt people on the, the local TV opportunity. Um, actually, in this kind of environment, we don't need to take up lots of expensive bandwidth. We're able to offer local channels via IP streams targeted to either the boxes or allowing people to search for content they actually want. So one of the things is actually if you create that people in London who are Scottish may actually be interested in Scottish news. So it's not tied to a physical location. We're saying, actually, you can choose to do this, you can elect to do this, you can opt in. Suddenly, here's a platform for bringing different types of television to the screen, on television, no streaming, um, in a way you wouldn't expect. And at the same time, we've done some work with um, a couple of police forces who currently put content onto YouTube and need to do alerts and streams where we've integrated their video with just generally their Twitter feeds. So you can actually see what's currently happening live in the community because these are things that are maintained. So one of the other really important things of the platform is to say, we're not asking anyone to do this again. They're not having to reauthor the content or the assets specifically for our platform. We're creating an aggregation point that takes those feeds and actually puts them onto the core TV platform. So again, that's that point around using the standards and the underlying infrastructure that's actually out there. Um, so one of the key things that, that we've kind of done is we've launched this new platform. Um, it's doing the TV stuff really well. People are finding content in ways they hadn't expected. It's actually a really great PVR with all the intelligent stuff. But actually, we, we now need to expand that. So. We've got, we've got it doing the main things it does. We're trying to take every customer on the journey. So we've not made anything complicated. This is just telly. They're already searching, discovering things in a different way to the way that they've done previously. But actually, they now want more. So we're working with different major brands to look at different ways of extending the platform and saying to people, here's an opportunity for you to take your services to a different audience. So um, CNBC, we have that's a nice integrated app that takes a live video feed with customizable stock tickers that run. So you've got the, you know, the live video coming from them with a portfolio around the edge of it. Um, we have announced earlier on this week, last week, um, Sky Anytime content is now available on our platform. So to the XL customer base, we've added thousands of hours of material that basically extends that experience. And that's real, that's, be careful. So that's on-demand content through our network and infrastructure that actually will stream high definition to the TiVo box and potentially to other platforms moving forward. So that's Sky Anytime delivered via a VOD service. And there's, that works with the existing base of traditional cable boxes, and then there are enhanced versions that we're working on for the TiVo platform. And then I won't go to too much detail, but you can see on the right there, there's a streaming music service um, that will be on our TiVo platform as well as others. So we've created that as a cross-platform product for people. So picking up on traditional web brands, web properties, TV properties, integrating them all into this single user experience that actually becomes a, a real entertainment hub for the customers. Um, but one of the key things is 
the, the TiVo box itself is obviously the, is, is the hub, it's the core of the experience. And we're constantly evolve, going to be evolving the key software. So the box itself, the, the TiVo software that sits on there, we released version one. We all know there's a version one. You know, we, we're listening to the customers. You know, this isn't, no, we can do it our way. So things that people were after were predictive text entry for when they're trying to actually key in search terms. So we've put in predictive text. Um, people found that the traditional TiVo style selection of recordings wasn't fast enough, so we've put in Express Series recording. But one of the most important things we're putting into the next release of the software is uh, box communication, and this probably plays to some of the connected home story, which is rather than this being a single PVR that doesn't talk to anything else, actually, what does this do inside a whole home solution? So we've said, okay, there's, you know, some of these are a little bit, we should ban the slides saying we're all doing every device everywhere, but there's a kind of a checklist. So we already have iPhone, Android, remote record apps that let you search and discover stuff outside of the home, in the home. Um, we've now launched, or well, we did launch at IBC, and are releasing the, the tablet companion app. Now, one of the key things with the tablet is it's not just an Uber remote control, which would be the easy thing to do. It actually, it knows what, what's playing on the TiVo boxes. So you can actually select, if you've got a number of TiVo boxes in your home and they're all on the same network, which is one of the issues that we're all gonna have to wrestle with, you can use the, t the tablet to see what's on the, what's on the main screen. You actually shift the UI moves from the TV onto the tablet. So you can continue searching, doing the other things, setting recordings without blocking, without covering up the TV screen itself, which is really important. Um, but it also enables you to share with the social networks. So there's a share button built in there that you press and it just says, you're watching this program currently, or I want to recommend this program to my network of friends. So one of the key things is, this isn't like a sort of a scavenger service that sits on top of everything and takes data and sort of is unaware of the key platform. It actually is part of the key platform. So we know the content that's showing, there's communication between the box and the device to actually keep, keep the experience consistent for the customers. Um, and as I say, you know, what we've built in here is we have box-to-box -box sharing. Um, so you can stream content from one box to the other, you can search. The biggest issue there is how you actually distribute that content around the home. So one of the advantages we have is that we, we actually maintain and operate the boxes for our customers. So that's part of the service wrap that we offer. Um, but we also install the wiring. So increasingly, we're looking at how we actually create consistent networks that actually let you do box to box streaming properly. It's fine, Wi-Fi to the companion apps is fine, but actually if you need to run high definition video between units, that's actually a, a whole home solution that you know, we can solve. There are things like Mocha and you know, Ethernet wiring and stuff, but, but actually as an industry, one of the things that we have in terms of the connected home is actually if we have all these devices, you know, we, we can deliver up to one and a half gig into the home, we've proven that. Actually, so distributing that video around the home is actually a bigger problem. And I think that's something that we're, we're all going to have to be wrestling with as we move forward. I'm just wary of time, a bit of context. Um, so one of the things we also realized is, you know, a lot of this is about opening up different platforms that actually the devices we're talking to actually have native capabilities themselves. So if, as we look at the different types of device, um, they have different capabilities that will be very expensive for us to develop or that we, we wouldn't deliver. So we've been working very closely with a number of the sort of the lobby groups, the, the interest groups for um, on, on things like accessibility. So one of the things we've realized is, and I don't know if this is gonna work, but the iPad actually has really good text to speech. So let's see if this will play. Hopefully it will. GNT with Georgia Legia 102. I shouldn't really show you this, but Selected. I just threw it in. GNT with Georgia Legia 102. And by the way, it's George Alagaya, but you Watch can't get it. Watch now. International news and intelligent analysis to take you to the heart of the day's top global story. 12.30 p.m. Yeah, even our furniture matches the brand, by the way. Um, but something that's written, yeah, but, but actually what that said is we, we could have tried to develop text-to-speech in the box or any other number of ways. But actually, there, there are very few text-to-speech engines in any kind of TV product. But actually, by saying, we know what's on the television, and before anyone wonders, a lot of people 
are, you know, have um, a visual impairment, that they can't necessarily read the text on the screen. So actually by using these companion devices, we realise that actually we can extend that into our ecosystem very quickly and very easily using you know, core software and again that underlying metadata to speak what's actually currently showing on the box. You know, so it's all very well having a now next banner on the TV screen, there's actually no use if you can't really read that properly. So actually what we're saying is there are a number of devices we can use, and this is just one example, where these companion devices actually let you extend the service quite dramatically and bring in an enhanced experience for people that you wouldn't normally address. You know, so that's actually something that by taking these companion devices, we really think it's kind of start to move the envelope without you know, sort of doing anything over engineering. We can get this solution out very quickly, whereas previously it might have taken three years to do a talking EPG. We're now able to use the device capability and push that forward. Um, so the inevitable slide of, uh, and yes, of course, we, actually it's interesting, it's lost the backdrop that had the clouds and the thing in there. Um, but one of the key things is, as well as all of that which I've just described, which happens in the home, so getting the content around multiple devices and sharing the content, um, we're looking at what we do when you come off of our network. And it, it's a real challenge because you know, we, we have this, you know, three HD tuners that are equivalent to 20 meg video in every one of those boxes. Every one of them has got a high-speed broadband connection into each of those TiVo units. We have a broadband connection into the home. Actually, how do we make sure that for the customers, when they leave that nice home environment, they can take part of this experience with them without it degrading so badly? So some of the things we're looking at is to say, how do, we, how do you remain connected to your media? So that may come from the video servers, which we've always had, or it may need to stream from, from your box. There's an issue there of what we do around transcoding, getting that video out into the wide area. Um, actually, one of the big things we've all picked up is actually the sharing of content, the recommending of content while you're on the move as well. So something we, we're looking at is if someone sends you a like, then it's integrated into the remote record app while you're out and about, so you can actually just say, yep, record that for me, I need the series link. Alternatively, it'll say, don't worry, it's on catch-up TV, when you get home, you can watch this kind of content. So it's saying to people, even though you're not at home, your viewing experience can be extended. You know, it's all part of being connected to the, to the home. Um, a huge one is, is the thumbs data. So with all of the effort, you, know, you find people are investing in training their box, getting the box to understand them. Actually, when they leave the home, if they're looking at media or want to do other things, how that translates into what they're seeing outside of the home. So one of the things that I think is going to be another interesting industry type problem is if everyone has lots of favourites in various places, how do we say we understand you and because you like that on that service, you like that on this service. So what we, you know, we're seeing a lot of um, sort of independent services that kind of sit above, you know, I kind of call them scavengers, but, but they're sort of stuff that sits above other things. But actually how do you make sure that the, the, the big platforms, the, the, the major services are actually able to share that kind of information with each other. You know, it's really important to say, I don't, need, I don't want to train Facebook to know one thing, Virgin Media, TiVo to know something else, BBC to know something else. Again, it's how, how do we pull that together? It's, it's very easy for us all to create a um, separate island of, of data, but actually moving forward, how do we actually say, we understand this and we, all, we can work together, you know, maybe not all of it, but share the viewing data and the viewing information. Um, the other thing we're looking at, and the, the thorny, you know, technology is actually ahead of the rights on this one, is actually if you've got stuff recorded on your TV at home, or we've got something available in the servers, are you entitled to watch that outside of the home? So technically, we're able to deliver that. Actually, from a rights perspective, it's not entirely clear. So a channel may show something, but certain elements of that channel, certain content on that channel may not be available to you if you actually move outside of the home. That's nothing, there's no technical restraint on that. That's just the contract we have and everyone will have with the rights holders. How do you share things that it's perfectly natural that you're sitting indoors and it's okay while your iPad's connected to your Wi-Fi if you actually move and the Wi-Fi goes down and it switches to 3G or 4G or LTE, whatever we're talking about, suddenly you don't have the rights to actually view that content, which is actually the way most of the rights are written. So they're, they're, they're some of the challenges we have is it's really hard to say to a customer, sorry, just because you moved from one room to the other and the device decided to switch to a different network, you can no longer watch the content. But that, that's the position we're actually currently in. 
So somehow that's something else that we need to actually address between us it is the rights, the flagging, all of these other things. Um, an example you know, that I, I use from the group is if, if I've rented a movie and I want to watch it, and I end up going on a Virgin Galactic shuttle, you know, no matter, you know, with all best will in the world, there's no cloud connecting anything to anyone up there. So what do we do around the sideloading of content? Again, you can watch something in the home, you can watch it while you're connected to a certain type of network, but if you lose the network, you're unable to watch the content that otherwise you, you would consider you're perfectly validly able to watch. So you know, all of those things are, are real issues that we're actually dealing with. Um, say to the customer, you know, we understand what you need, it's simple, you do it in the home, you do it around the home, and now you can do it outside of the home. But actually, how do we explain to you that you can't get hold of that content? And you know, that goes back to the key message of this, which is trying to make all of this simple for the customer. Um, we've made a lot of effort on one UI, we're moving it to the next one, and suddenly the barrier isn't actually necessarily the technology anymore, it's actually trying to explain to the customer what they have and haven't bought. And that's, you know, that's actually going to be a real challenge for all of us. So I've just realized I've got about two minutes left. I kind of overran because I went on a roll there about rights. So, um, I mean, that's kind of where I got to. So I could say questions or... Yeah, sorry, I just didn't. Hi, Ray from Lithuania. How do you use, uh, use uh, how do you solve the user profile if there's more than one user watching a CNT TV set? Yeah, we decided deliberately that logging onto television wasn't really a good idea in the first instance. Um, so we started looking at that and we decided we'd put that to one side. So the way we will probably address that is by saying, if people are using the companion devices, which tend to be more personal, then that's how we will influence the behavior. But otherwise, each, each unit takes its own personality, which is the shared personality. We, we did look at profiles, but it, it's really, it's, it's back to the, the early thing of, is it television or is it a computer? And on the whole, people just do not log on to their televisions. And if you log on to the television with the wrong profile, um, daddy's special movies may appear the next morning when the kids get up early. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of issues around doing that. So we're trying to say, let, let's treat this as a family unit or as a single unit. So each device takes its own personality, but at the moment we, we've, we've actually removed the logons. We, we did have profiles, and it was just too confusing for people for, for television. Hi, Ian. Um, you said um, it's not a walled garden and you're offering paths to an outside world. Um, obvious question. Um, when Netflix arrive, are you going to let your customers get Netflix? I couldn't comment on any specifics. Many other video services are available, as our BBC friends would say. Um, I, th I think the point is the platform there, you saw there was a music service, for example. Um, it, it's a way of bringing stuff to the customers and it's a balance, you know, it's, it's, it's not an open free-for-all um, as Netflix on US products isn't. So, so it is a walled garden, I guess. With some doors. That right. was the key. It, it's a managed, I mean, I think the key point is it's a managed environment rather than an open web thing because the, the whole thing is family security, respecting the rights of content providers, all of the key things that a platform has to offer means that you need to manage it to a degree. You know, we allow you to go out to YouTube, you go out to the iPlayer. Once you're in those environments, that's entirely down to those providers. But we, we, we'll put doors in the garden. Coffee's available in the exhibition hall. Uh, we'll begin the sessions at 10.30. Uh, track A will be in here. Track B and the Connected Home Summit is uh, across the hall. Uh, also, the wireless is uh, the Wi-Fi. Uh, the SSID is streaming underscore Europe. And the password is info today. Um, you, can, you can ask me or Bill Spence, our IT uh, expert, at the other end of the stage if you have any questions about that. Uh, also, there will be a reception from 5 p.m. until 6 p.m. in the Expo Hall. 
where we will be presenting the 2011 Streaming Media Reader's Choice Awards uh, for Europe. So I hope you can join us then. Uh, again, thanks, Ian, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.